Before we begin our tour through the economy, the environment, and energy, we need to share a common understanding of money. Money is something that we live with so intimately on a daily basis that it has probably escaped our close attention. Money is an essential human creation, and where all money did disappear, a new form of money would spontaneously arise in its place, such as uh, cows, tobacco, bread, a certain type of nut husk perhaps, or even nautilus shells. Without money, the complex job specializations that we have today would not exist because barter is so cumbersome and constraining. More importantly, though, is the concept that each type of money system has its pros and cons. Each will enforce its own peculiar outcomes by promoting some behaviors while suppressing others. Now, if we crack open a textbook, we'll find that money should possess three characteristics. The first is that it should be a store of value. Gold and silver have filled this role perfectly because they were rare, took a lot of human energy to mine, and did not corrode or rust. By contrast, the U.S. dollar pretty much constantly loses value over time, a feature which punishes savers and enforces the need to speculate. A second feature is that money needs to be widely accepted within a population as an intermediary within and across all economic transactions. And the third feature is that money needs to be a unit of account, meaning that the money must be divisible and each unit must be equivalent. The U.S. unit of account is the dollar. Diamonds have much value but are not good at being money because they are not perfectly equivalent to each other and dividing causes them to lose value. That is, they fail at being a unit of account. Blah, blah, blah. So what is money really? I believe it has a very simple definition. Money is a claim on human labor. With a very few minor exceptions, pretty much anything you can think of that you might spend your money on will involve human labor to bring it there. I say it's a claim on labor rather than a store of labor because the human labor in question might have happened in the past or it might not have happened yet. The concept of money being a claim on human labor is important, and we'll be building on it later, especially when we get to debt. As implied in the pictures earlier, literally anything can be considered money. Cows, bread, shells, tobacco. A U.S. dollar, like all modern currencies, however, is an example of a type of money called fiat money. Fiat is a Latin word meaning let it be done. And fiat money has value because a government decrees that it does. And this brings us to the key question. What exactly is a U.S. dollar? Once a dollar was backed by a known weight of silver or gold of intrinsic value. In this example, we can see the dollar came from the U.S. Treasury and was backed by a given amount of silver that was payable to the bear upon demand. Of course, that was back in the 1930s, and those days are long gone. Now dollars are the liability of an outfit called the Federal Reserve, a private entity entrusted to manage the U.S. money supply and empowered by the Federal Reserve Act of 1913 to perform this vital function. You'll note that modern dollars have no language entitling the bearer to anything, and that's because they're no longer backed by anything tangible. Rather, the value of a dollar comes from this language right here, the fact that it is illegal to refuse to accept dollars for payment, and that Federal Reserve notes are the only acceptable form of payment for taxes. It is crucially important that a nation's money supply is carefully managed, for if it is not, the monetary unit can be destroyed by inflation. In fact, there are over 3,800 past examples of paper currencies that no longer exist. These are numerous examples from the United States, which may have some collector value, but no longer possess any monetary value. Of course, I could just as easily display beautiful but no longer functional examples from Argentina, Bolivia, and Colombia, and a hundred other places. How does the hyperinflationary destruction of a currency happen? Here's a relatively recent example that comes from Yugoslavia between the years 1988 and 1995. Pre-1990, the Yugoslavian dinar, seen here, had measurable value. You could actually buy something with one. 
However, throughout the 1980s, the Yugoslavian government ran a persistent budget deficit and printed money to make up the shortfall. By the early 1990s, the government had used up all its own hard currency reserves, and they proceeded to loot the private accounts of citizens. In order to keep things moving along, successively larger bills had to be printed, finally culminating in this stunning example, a 500 billion dinar note. At its height, inflation in Yugoslavia was running at over 37% per day, and this meant that prices were doubling every 48 hours or so. Let me see if I can make this a bit more concrete for you. Suppose that on January 1st, 2007, you had a penny, and you could find something to buy with it. At 37% per day inflation, by April 3rd, 2007, you'd need one of these, a billion dollar bill to purchase the very same item. Stated in reverse, if you had a billion dollars on January 1st stuffed in a suitcase, by April 3rd, you'd have had a penny's worth of purchasing power left. Clearly, if you'd attempted to save money during this period of time, you'd have lost it all. So we can safely state that inflationary money regimes impose a penalty on savers. The opposite side of this is that inflationary money regimes promote spending and require that money be invested or even speculated with so as to at least have the chance of keeping pace with inflation. Of course, investing and speculating involve risks, so we can broaden this statement to include the claim that inflationary money systems require the citizens living within them to subject their hard-earned savings to risk. Now that's worth pondering for a minute or two. Even more importantly, since history shows how common it is for currencies to be mismanaged, we need to keep a careful eye on the stewards of our money to make sure they are not being irresponsible by creating too much money out of thin air and thereby destroying our savings, our culture, and institutions in the process. Wait a minute. Did I just say creating money out of thin air? Yes. Yes, I did. This is such an important process to your, our, my future that we're going to spend the next two sections learning how money is created. If you're ready, proceed on. Now we're going to discover where money is created. The process works like this. Suppose Congress needs more money than it has. I know, that's a stretch. Perhaps it's done something really historically foolish, like um, cutting taxes while conducting two wars at the same time. Now, Congress doesn't actually have any money, so the request for additional spending gets passed over to the Treasury Department. You may be surprised, or dismayed, or perhaps neither, to learn that the Treasury Department lives hand to mouth and rarely has more than a couple weeks of cash on hand, if that. So the Treasury Department, in order to raise cash, will print up a stack of Treasury bonds, which are the means by which the U.S. government borrows money. A bond has a face value, which is the amount it will be sold for, and it has a stated rate of interest that it will pay to the holder. So if you bought a bond with $100 face value and that paid a rate of interest of 5%, then you'd pay $100 for this bond, and you'd get $105 back in a year. Treasury bonds are sold regularly in auctions, and it's safe to say that the majority of these bonds are bought by big banks, such as those of China and Japan recently. At auction, the banks purchase these bonds, and then money gets sent into the Treasury coffers, where it can be dispersed for the usual array of government programs. Now, I promised you that I'd show you how money first comes into being, and so far that hasn't happened, has it? The bonds are being bought with money that already exists in the banking system. Money is created by this next mechanism, where the Federal Reserve buys a treasury bond from a bank. When the Fed does this, they simply transfer money and the amount of the bond to the other bank and take possession of the bond. A bond is swapped for money. 
Now, where did this money come from? Glad you asked. It comes out of thin air as the Fed creates money when it buys this debt. New Fed money is always exchanged for debt. And so now we can put the title on this page. All dollars are loaned into existence. You don't believe me? Here's a quote from a Federal Reserve publication entitled, Putting It Simply. When you or I write a check, there must be sufficient funds in our account to cover the check. But when the Federal Reserve writes a check, there is no bank deposit on which that check is drawn. When the Federal Reserve writes a check, it is creating money. Wow, now that is an extraordinary power. Whereas you or I need to work to obtain money and place it at risk to have it grow, the Federal Reserve simply prints up as much as it wishes whenever it wants and then loans it to us all via the U.S. government with interest. Given the fact that over 3,800 paper currencies and a few metallic ones have been rendered worthless due to mismanagement, wouldn't it make sense to keep a very close eye on whether or not the Federal Reserve is acting responsibly? So now we know that there are two kinds of money out there. The first is bank credit, which is money that is loaned into existence, as we saw here. Bank credit is a type of money that comes with an equal and offsetting amount of debt associated with it, debt upon which interest must be paid. And the second type of money is printed out of thin air, and that's what you see right here at this stage. The process by which money is created is so simple that the mind is repelled. So don't worry if you need to review this chapter several more times. However, if you understood all that and get it, well, congratulations, give yourself a hand, because it's not easy. These monetary learnings allow us to formulate two more extremely important key concepts. The first is that all dollars are backed by debt. At the local bank level, all new money is loaned into existence. At the Federal Reserve level, money is simply manufactured out of thin air and then exchanged for interest-paying government debt. In both cases, the money is backed by debt debt that pays interest. From this key concept, we can formulate a truly profound statement, which is that, at a minimum, each year, enough new money must be loaned into existence to cover the interest payments on all of the past outstanding debt. If we flip this slightly, we can say that each year, all the outstanding debt must compound by at least the rate of interest on that debt. Each and every year, it must grow by some percentage. Because our debt-based money system is growing by some percentage continually, it is an exponential system by its very design. A corollary of this is that the amount of debt in the system will always exceed the amount of money in the system. I'm not going to cast judgment on this and say that it's good or bad. It simply is what it is. By understanding its design, though, you will be better equipped to understand that the potential range of future outcomes for our economy are not limitless, but rather bounded by the rules of the system, all of which leads us to the fourth key concept, which is that perpetual expansion is a requirement of modern banking. In fact, we can make a rule. Each year, new credit or loans must be made that at least equal the amount of all the outstanding interest payments that year. Without a continuous expansion of the money supply, past debts would not be able to be serviced and defaults would ripple through and possibly destroy the system. Defaults are the Achilles heel of a debt-based money system, which we saw in our local banking example in the previous chapter. Because of this, all the institutional and political forces in our society are geared towards avoiding this outcome. So the banking system 
must continually expand. Not necessarily because it's the right or wrong thing to do, but rather simply because that is how it was designed. It's a feature of the system, just like using gasoline is a feature of my car's engine. I might wish and hope that my car would run on straw, but I'd be wasting my time because that's just not how it was designed. By understanding the requirement for continual expansion, we will be in a better position to make informed decisions about what's likely to transpire and take meaningful actions to enhance our prospects. So the key question is this. What happens when a human-contrived money system that must expand by its very design runs headlong into the physical limits of a spherical planet? One more belief of mine is that I will witness this collision in my adult lifetime, and in fact it may have already started, and I am extremely interested to see how this is all going to turn out. Now, this is admittedly a truly gigantic proposition to consider, and some would say that it's not very interesting at all, but rather it's just frightening. Well, if you want the future to look exactly like the past, then I suppose it is frightening. But if you are flexible in your view of the future, then you have an opportunity to make the most of whatever future actually arrives. These are fascinating, invigorating, and truly unprecedented times. And I am thrilled to be living right here, right now, with you. In the next section, we'll be looking at some very important historical context about our money system where you'll learn that our money system could be viewed as a masterpiece of sophisticated evolution or as an historically brief experiment that is not yet 37 years old. Let's go. We've got one more key concept in front of us, and that's inflation. And then we're going to connect a few dots at the end. Most of us think of inflation as rising prices, but that's not quite right. Imagine if an apple and an orange are a dollar each one year, but ten dollars each next year. Since you enjoy eating apples and oranges the same in one year as the next, then the only thing that's truly changed here is your money, which has declined in value. Inflation is not caused by rising prices. Rising prices are instead a symptom of inflation. Inflation is caused by the presence of too much money in relation to goods and services. What we experience are things going up in price, but in fact inflation is really the value of your money going down, simply because there's too much of it around. Here's an example. Suppose you're on a life raft and somebody has an orange that they are willing to sell for money. Only one person in the raft has any money, and that's a single dollar. So the orange sells for a dollar. But wait, just before it sells, you find a $10 bill in your pocket. Now, how much do you suppose the orange sells for? That's right, 10 bucks. It's still the same orange, right? Nothing about the utility or desirability of the orange has changed from one minute to the next. Only the amount of money kicking around in the raft. So we can make this claim. Inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. And what's true within a tiny life raft is equally true across an entire nation. Here, let me illustrate this point by using a long sweep of U.S. history. What we're looking at here is a graph of price levels in the United States that begins on the left in 1665 and progresses more than 300 years to 2008 on the right. But at this moment, only inflation over the period from 1665 to 1776 is marked on this chart. On the y-axis, what is being charted are price levels, not the rate of inflation. Now you might ask, how can we compare prices in 1665 to 2008? Well, there are some obvious liberties that have to be taken here. What is being compared are the basics of life. People ate food in 1665, just as they did later on. People had to transport themselves. They got educations, and they lived in houses in 1665, just as they did in 1776. So what is being compared is the relative cost of living in one period to the next. 
That is inflation. In 1665, the basic cost of living was set to a value of 5. Now, what is most striking about this chart to me is that from 1665 to 1776, there was absolutely no inflation. For 111 years, a dollar saved was, well, a dollar saved. Can you imagine what it would be like to live in a world where you could earn $1,000, put it in a coffee can in the backyard, and your great-great-grandchildren could dig it up and enjoy the same benefits from that $1,000 as you would have 111 years previously? This isn't some fantasy from a cheap novella. This was reality in our country at one time. The country was on a gold and silver standard during this period and advanced tremendously while enjoying near-perfect price stability during times of peace. However, along comes a war, the Revolutionary War, and the country found itself unable to pay for the war with the gold and silver in the treasury. So a paper currency called Continentals was printed. And at first it was fully backed by a specified amount of real gold and silver in the treasury. But then the war proved to be more expensive than thought, and more and more of these were printed. Then the British, aware of the corrosive effects of inflation on society, started counterfeiting and distributing vast amounts of bogus continentals, and soon the currency began to collapse. Before long, massive inflation took hold. Seen on the inflation chart, the Revolutionary War took the general price level from a reading of 5 to a reading of 8. After the war, the paper continentals were utterly rejected by the people, who strongly preferred gold and silver. Most interestingly, price levels promptly returned back to the pre-war levels. The next serious bout of inflation was also associated with the war, again due to the overprinting of paper currency, and again, upon conclusion of the war, we saw a relatively prompt return of prices to the pre-war levels where they stayed for an additional 30 years. By now, we are nearly 200 years into this chart, and we find that the cost of living is roughly the same as it was in 1665. But then a war came along, the Civil War this time, and it was a doozy. To finance the war, the North had to resort to printing a type of currency that still lends its name to our own currency today. Of course, back then, it really did have a green back. Again, we see a rapid rise of inflation as a direct consequence of war, and again, a return to baseline after the crisis is over. We are now 250 years into this story, and the cost of living is still roughly the same as it was at the start. I invite you to think about that for a minute. But then another war came along. And this one was even bigger than any before, and again it was a highly inflationary event. And then another war, even bigger than any before it, which again proved inflationary. But this time, something odd happened. Inflation did not retreat before the next war began. Why? Two reasons. First, the country was no longer on a gold standard, but instead a fiat paper standard administered by the Federal Reserve, and the populace did not have another form of currency to which it could turn. And second, because this was the first time that the war apparatus was not dismantled upon conclusion of hostilities. Instead, full mobilization was maintained and a protracted Cold War was fought, certainly as inflationary a conflict as any shooting war ever was. And now, if we look at the entire sweep of history, we can make an utterly obvious conclusion. All wars are inflationary. Why is this? Because any time the government engages in deficit spending, it creates the conditions for inflation. However, when the deficit spending is on legitimate infrastructure, such as roads or bridges or schools, that investment will slowly pay for itself by boosting productivity and paving the way for the creation of additional goods and services that will someday soak up the extra cash. Wars, however, are special. Vast quantities of money are spent on things that are meant to be blown up. The money stays at home while the goods get sent off to be blown up. 
When a bomb blows up, there's no residual benefit to the domestic economy later on. This means war spending is the most inflationary of all spending. It's a double whammy. The money stays behind working its evil magic while the goods it produced are destroyed. Heck, even if the goods aren't blown up, there's practically zero residual economic benefit to such specialized hardware, as amazing as that technology may be. For some reason, the most recent pair of wars have been presented by the U.S. mainstream press as being relatively pain-free for the average citizen, despite overwhelming historical odds to the contrary. In fact, on this 15-year-long chart of commodity prices, we observe that prices bounced in a channel, marked by the green lines, for more than 10 years. However, and hopefully by now unsurprisingly, shortly after the start of the Iraq War, Commodity prices began marching higher and have inflated nearly 140% in five years. Your gasoline and food bills will confirm this. So if anybody tries to tell you that you haven't sacrificed for the war, let them know you sacrificed a large portion of your savings and your paycheck to the effort. Thank you very much. At any rate, back to our main story. Here's inflation between 1665 in 1975. Knowing what you now know about Nixon's actions on August 15, 1971, what do you suppose the rest of the graph looks like between 1975 and today? This is your world. You've been living on the steeply rising portion of this graph for so long that it probably looks like level ground to you. Because inflation is now a permanent feature, and because it advances at a percentage rate, your money is declining in value exponentially. That's what this hockey stick graph is telling you. What does it mean to live in a world where your money loses value exponentially? You know what it means because you live there. It means always having to work harder and harder just to stay in place. And it means perplexing and astoundingly risky investment decisions have to be made in an attempt to grow one's savings fast enough to avoid the ravages of inflation. It means two incomes are needed where one used to suffice and kids left at home while both parents work. A world of constantly eroding money is a devilishly complicated world to navigate and leaves scant room for error, especially for those without the appropriate means or connections. And it doesn't have to be this way, and indeed for the majority of our country's history, as you can see, it wasn't. And I'm hard-pressed to say that inflation is a necessity and serves some essential and greater good because a lot of progress and advancement happened between 1665 and 1940 without the benefit of perpetual inflation. To help put all of this in context, let's mark the moments when our country abandoned the gold standard first internally, and then completely. It may have surprised some of you, as it did me, to find out that inflation is not a mysterious law of nature like gravity, but rather an extremely well-characterized matter of policy. So now we have our fifth key concept. Inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. Flipped a bit, we can say that inflation is a deliberate act of policy. Here's what one wag had to say about this matter. Paper money eventually returns to its intrinsic value. Zero. That was Voltaire in 1729. Of course, he was a bit too pessimistic in his assessment as this German woman proves by using her furnace to liberate the intrinsic heat content of paper money. John Maynard Keynes, the father of the branch of economics that utterly dominates our lives, had this to say about inflation. Lenin was certainly right. There is no more positive or subtle or sure means of destroying the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency. By a continuing process of inflation, governments can confiscate, secretly and unobserved, an important part of the wealth of the citizens. The process engages all of the hidden forces of economics on the side of destruction and does it in a manner that not one man in a million can diagnose. Given that the destructive, corrosive effects of inflation are so well understood 
by the architects and the administrators of our monetary system. It's fair to wonder exactly what the plan here is. Now, finally, here in Chapter 10 of the Crash Course, we can string together these three very important dots. Number one, in 1971, the U.S., and by extension the world, terminated the last connection to a gold restraint, and federal borrowing turned the corner never to look back. Concurrently, the money supply turned the corner, piling up at a much faster rate than the growth of goods and services. And so we get to data point number three, which is that inflation is the fully predictable outcome of data points one and two. Boom, boom, boom. One, two, three. All connected, all saying the same thing, with profound implications for your future. Now, if you're of a mind that there's no reason that all three of these graphs cannot just continue to exponentially accelerate to ever higher amounts without end, then there's no point in watching the rest of the crash course. However, if you don't happen to believe that, then you're going to want to see the rest of this. There is literally nothing more important for you to be doing right now than gaining an understanding of how these pieces fit together assessing the risks for yourself, and taking actions to prepare for the possibility of a future that's substantially different from today. Now that we've covered compounding, money, and inflation, you have the tools to get the most from the remaining sections of the crash course. We have a few more dots to connect. Let's go. Holders of that debt don't get their money back. Boom! The claims get diminished. In this instance, if the future isn't large enough to pay back the claims, then defaults are simply a way of not paying them back. The inflation route can be confusing, so think of it this way. What if you sold your house to someone and elected to hold a note for $500,000? The terms call for the note to be repaid all at once in 10 years as a single payment of $650,000. Well, what if you get paid your $650,000? right on time, but that $650,000 will only buy this house. You got paid all right, but your claim on the future was vastly diminished by inflation. In the default scenario, your money is still worth something, but you don't get it back. In the inflation scenario, you get it back, but it hardly buys anything. In both cases, your future was diminished, so the impact is very nearly the same but the means of achieving it are wildly different. So the questions you need to ponder for yourself are, have too many claims been made on the future? And if so, will we face inflation or defaults as the means of squaring things up? You will arrive at wildly different life decisions depending on whether you answer yes or no to the first question and inflation or defaults to the second question so they are worth pondering. All right, here's what we learned. Key concept number six, debt is a claim on future human labor. Second, per capita debt has never been higher. We are in truly unprecedented territory in this country. Debt has increased by $16 trillion in the past five years, and most of it consumptive debt. This means that future consumption will have to be seriously curtailed or will enter a period of debt destruction, either by default or inflation. And finally, key concept number seven, our debt markets assume that the future will be much larger than the present. Our entire economic system, and by extension our way of life, is founded on debt. And debt is founded on the assumption that the future will always be bigger than the past. Therefore, it is utterly vital that we examine this assumption closely because if this assumption is false, so are a lot of other things we may be taking for granted. Whew. All right, we are done. I'll see you next time.